we're back on the Zero Hour. I'm your host, Richard R.J. Eskow. Joining us once again is our friend Max Blumenthal. Max is a journalist. He is an author. He is the founder and co-editor of The Gray Zone, which can be found at thegrayzone.com. That's a U.S. spelling of gray, G-R-A-Y. And his latest book is The Management of Sal Savagery. And he is also the co-host of the Moderate Rebels podcast with Ben Norton. So first of all, uh, having uh, completed that exhaustive introduction, Max, welcome back to the program. Good to be back. Well, there's a lot on the foreign policy front and perhaps a little on the domestic front, too, that I'd like to discuss with you. But let's start with this. Ukraine is in the headlines, just a couple randomly picked uh, as we were coming on air. U.S. and other NATO members pledge support to Ukraine while walking fine line with Russia, says CNN. And uh, The Hill says U.K. summons Russian ambassador over cyber attacks Ukraine. But while this is being presented in the media as a kind of multinational expression of concern, about Ukraine and against Russia, it seems to me the United States is the driving force behind all of this. Am I wrong about that? No, that that's right. And I think, you know, there are internal dynamics in Ukraine that are dictating the tensions on the ground or driving them. So let's talk about them. What are they? I, um, you know, I know there are obviously for our listeners who don't know, which is probably very few, but there's a Russian-speaking population in that country, majority Ukrainian-speaking, tensions between the two groups, uh, some talk that the Russian, the nationalist uh, Russians would like to annex the Russian-speaking portion of that country, but what else is going on that could be driving that? Well, the background to it all is this 2014 coup which the U.S. clearly drove. I mean, you saw Victoria Newland is back in the State Department, wife of the neocon project for a new American century architect, Robert Kagan and John McCain and uh, uh, Jeffrey Piat, the U.S. ambassador openly in Maidan Square, pushing for the coup, uh, the leaked phone conversation of Newland and Piat. Um, determining who would serve in the Ukrainian government, Biden coming in in 2015 and acting as the kind of imperial lord of Ukraine. All of this background is significant because a oligarchic uh, nationalist government came into power on the heels of uh, the burning alive of uh, Russian-speaking Ukrainians who were protesting the coup in Odessa, uh, the Russian-speaking population began to be marginalized. And an area of Ukraine, which previously was part of Russia, Crimea, had a referendum and voted to uh, be returned to Russia. And the Russian government was pushing to annex Crimea. So this provided the pretext. And Putin was accused of using little green men and hybrid warfare to technically invade Crimea and also to assist pro-Russian separatists in the Donbass region, which is another Russian-speaking region, which was essentially under siege by this new Ukrainian government and the Ukrainian army. And there certainly was kind of semi-covert Russian military assistance, particularly in the Donbass now what we're seeing is an open display with the Russian military actually facing the Ukrainian military. And so what, what, what is behind that? What triggered this freak out? Well, a, nightlife, a, a nighttime comedian, like, or even not a nighttime comedian, just a, a comedian who hosted a very popular reality show where he impersonated the president of Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky, was elected on a ticket to, on a campaign to fulfill the Minsk Accords with Russia to bring peace. The Ukrainian population was sick of this endless kind of trench war in the Donbass region where a few artillery shells would fly over the lines every few days and kill civilians. Uh, and the Ukrainian military, they're basically being used as bullet stoppers by the US. 
to turn up the heat on Russia. So they're sick of it. Zelensky comes in and now he's completely abandoned that uh, any plan for peace. He is now posing as the war president in order to win over hardliners in Kiev as his popularity slips. He has been banning opposition media, which the US calls Russian propaganda stations, which are just simply privately run opposition media, which cater uh, largely to the interests and sensibilities of the Russian speaking population. He's just shutting them down. And the State Department has openly supported this anti-democratic shutdown of opposition media. In addition, he has been sending armor and troops to the border for weeks. I mean, there's a pl plenty of video online if you wanna look for it of Ukrainian armor being sent to the front. He has also issued a formal declaration calling to return Crimea to Ukraine. So basically to retake Crimea by force, which is absolutely militarily impossible. The Ukrainian military would get wiped out like the Georgian military did in South Ossetia in 2008. Russian art uh, there would just be a brutal combined Russian artillery and tank assault. But he's doing that to cater to the hardliners, the ultranationalists, and to shore up his domestic base. And so we saw Zelensky recently visit the front lines uh, on, of the Donbass. And on the other side, the pro-Russian side, the sort of patriotic pro-Russian militias took surveillance footage of a literal Nazi flag, the flag of the Third Reich, waving over Ukrainian positions as, uh, at the same positions that Zelensky had just visited. So all of this looks pretty terrible from a Russian point of view. Uh, Ukraine has announced its intention to join NATO and Russia has brought its own troops to the border. And now the way this is being framed in the US media and in the West is that Russia simply wants to invade Ukraine. This is Russian aggression. And no one ever thinks about it from the other side. And I think that's the most important thing to do is to do a little thought exercise. Imagine for a second that the United States was a much weaker country and the Mexican government right. or the Canadian government were aligned with, they had had a coup and they had aligned themselves with a Russian Chinese bloc and Russia and China were supplying them with weapons. There was a Russian Chinese military alliance that was already surrounding the US. Uh, let's say, you know, there are missiles from Cuba pointing at the US from this military alliance. There are missiles from Puerto Rico, missiles from Hawaii. Uh, you know, maybe a few states in the US had joined this alliance and suddenly one of these large countries on the US border wants to join that military alliance and point is already pointing missiles at the US and there's already a low intensity war on the US Mexico or US Canadian border what would the United States do in that position because that is precisely the position that Russia finds itself in and Americans are unable to embark on this thought exercise because of the exceptionalist mentality that we have been uh, cult cultivated into. So there was a really fascinating exchange about six days ago at the State Department, Ned Price, the new, uh, he's really like, he's such a Ned, like he really has that Ned energy, but he's the new spokesman and he was asked by Matt Lee, who fills the role of Helen Thomas and asked the adversarial questions at these socially distanced uh, press briefings. Why is it a threat of invasion if Russia is only moving troops within Russian borders? Like if you look at mainstream media, New York Times, Washington Post, whatever, you'll think that Russia actually is conducting exercises inside Ukraine. And he, you know, Matt Lee said, you know, the U.S. moves its troops inside its own borders for military exercises. Kenya moves its troops inside its own borders and India and so on and so on. How is that a threat? And Ned Price was really unable to provide a coherent answer. He sort of went into contortions. And that really speaks to the mindset
of the characters surrounding Biden, you have some serious anti-Russian fanatics who are, who are surrounding Biden right now. And well, and it seems to me, Max, that, you know, something I've been thinking about a lot is, uh, you know, while people can debate the adequacy of Biden's response domestically, uh, there are signs that he's being pressured and is aware of pressure from the left to do more than Democrats have traditionally wanted to do. I would argue much more needs to be done, but there, there aren't even signs of that in terms of military policy, foreign policy. And right. the reason for that to me is simple, because there is no pressure from the left when it comes to something like Ukraine. That there's no understanding of the issue. There's no understanding of the risks that go along with military confrontation with another nuclear superpower. Uh, there's no understanding of what you described of the local geopolitics. I mean, I'll take your Mexico analogy one further and say that if, if Texas, if portions of Texas and Arizona voted to rejoin Mexico and Mexico said, well, okay, we're going to go get it you know, with the backing of Russia, I think there would be alarm in the United States. And uh, also, uh, if I recall correctly, Bill Clinton himself promised that NATO would never extend itself directly against the borders of Russia, that it would stay out of countries like Ukraine. And so you have this enormous escalation on our side of it. I think there's a lack of pressure to challenge that and a complete lack of understanding of what the implications of that are. I mean, do you, I assume you agree with that, but let me know. No, completely. And it was the George H.W. Bush administration that promised Gorbachev that basically, sorry, right. yeah. if you just basically abandon this, not just this communist Soviet project, but this, this socialist project, because Gorbachev was under the deluded impression that the West and the US was going to help him reform the Soviet Union and they would adopt kind of a social democratic, maybe Scandinavian style model and he would receive lots of aid. Uh, and he, he learned the hard way and wound up in a Pizza Hut ad. But uh, J Jim Baker, who was Bush's secretary of state promised, you know, NATO will not expand eastward uh, towards your borders. We're not going past Germany. And that proved to be a complete lie, just like everything that the uh, U.S. government promised the Native American tribes, uh, right. including, you know, with the Black Hills Treaty, which they put on paper, was just a, the, the U.S. abrogates treaty after treaty. Look at what they're doing with the JCPOA and Iran. Um, look right. at what they're doing with the withdrawal deadline that they signed with the Taliban. They just violate it freely. And uh, the, the, the these contracts that are just put into writing are, ab are completely abrogated to the interests of the military intelligence bureaucracy and other, and the, you know, financial interests. Can so, we take a brief yeah. side trip along that line before yeah. we maybe go back to Ukraine? On the whole treaty issue, two very uh, current stories on that that have been, uh, you know, uh, really bothering me, and I hear nothing about. Number one is the Iran Treaty, which you mentioned, which is yeah. a treaty among six countries that we unilaterally withdrew from. And now we're saying, sure, we'll come back in, but we're going to add new conditions to it. It's like, it, that's like if I say, Matt, I'll pay you 50 bucks for your old stereo. And then after I get the stereo, I say, well, let's discuss. I'm thinking 35 is better. That's not uh, that's not negotiating. And the other is the Open Skies Treaty. And the fact that this treaty, uh, a multi number of countries, primarily United States and Russia, allowed to overfly other countries. And, uh, and uh, you know, transparency was the goal. Uh, I believe the Bush administration, second one, uh, ratified it in 2002, we withdrew, then Russia withdrew. Now the Biden administration is saying, we don't want to go back in because Russia is violating it. And first of all, they can't be violating it because they're not a party to it anymore because they withdrew. Uh, so that's double speak. And secondly, we left. We should be the ones to go back if we still believe in the principle of open skies. So I suppose that was more of a rant than a question, but thoughts? 
Yeah. And, you know, you, you have the best analogies that really bring it home. Um, I mean, the U.S. just, the Biden administration just imposed a whole uh, round of new sanctions on Russia today on the basis of uh, basically Russia gate intrigues about cyber hacking and solar winds. And at the same time, the Biden administration has announced through the media that it is going to wage a, a cyber attack on Russia at some point in the future in response to all this. So cyber attacks are so wrong that the Biden administration has announced that it will wage one. Uh, Russia has withdrawn its ambassador from Washington because of all of this hostility. There, I, I don't know what kind of diplomacy is taking place. And we just talked about all the tensions in Ukraine. And, now, and then we have uh, the Iran deal, which the Biden administration promised to return to. I didn't believe them at all during the campaign because of the preponderance of power that the Israel lobby has, not just over the Biden administration, but over the Democratic Party and particularly the Senate. Uh, and Bob Menendez is, uh, is, I think he's like the, the chair of the Senate Foreign Affairs Committee. So, And didn't uh, Chuck Schumer originally oppose that treaty or I misrepresent? Schumer, you know, didn't just oppose it. I mean, he railed against it constantly. Uh, you know, Chuck Schumer... He said, he said, my name is Ch um, Chuck. He told the pro-Israel audience, my name is Chuck Shomer. Shomer means to protect in Hebrew. And his job, he said, was to protect Israel. Then Bob Menendez, uh, I mean, this guy's basically just like a mafia don in the Senate who went on trial for corruption, or maybe more like a mafia wise guy because he's being protected by more powerful forces. He was on trial for corruption and his legal bills were paid for entirely by APAC donors. This was something that was out in the open. So he emerges out of those corruption trials, still in the Senate. And, you know, I think he owes them one. He's, I think, one of the three top recipients of pro-Israel donations in the Senate. And this is the person that, you know, the negotiation has to approve these negotiations. I don't think so. Although, to be fair, he knows a guy who knows a guy who could. Yeah. Um, well, the, then you well, let me just say uh, sure. you got you got Tony Blinken, who is deeply, deeply personally attached to Israel, passionately attached to Israel, is um, comes from a, 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 no, a no, noted pro-Israel family. His father, Samuel Pissar, his stepfather who raised him, was a powerful kind of pro-Israel uh, political broker in Europe, particularly in France. He helped found the French Israel lobby. Uh, Tony Blinken told a pro audience that he inherited his commitment to Israel's strength and security from his family. I mean, can you imagine if the Secretary of State was a Chinese American and they said, I inherited my commitment to, to China and the People's Liberation Army from my family? How, how would that go over? So this is the person who's supposed to negotiate the Iran deal. And look at what they're saying. Like you said, they're just demanding new conditions that Iran meet, that Iran completely humiliate itself while Israel is carrying out literal terrorist attacks on Iran's energy infrastructure. And this I is, wanted yeah. Go, and I want to make some thought to, along those lines to talk for a second about you know, there are always people who hear something like this show and say, well, you know, so they're anti-Israel, they're anti-Semitic, they're this and that. I mean, let's just talk for a second about what in a context like this pro-Israel means, because to me, it means pro-Israeli government policy of the last number of decades regarding denial of rights to the Palestinian people regarding uh, open violation of international law, uh, violent attacks on peaceful demonstrators. Um, you know, people sometimes you hear people say, well, why don't the Palestinians protest peacefully? Well, they've been protesting peacefully and they've been getting shot down. So to me, when you talk about being pro-Israel, to me, what that means is pro those policies and therefore unwilling to exert any pressure on the Israeli government to uh, to change those policies. But maybe you have a definition, different definition. I don't know. Well, I, yeah, I mean, the, the, these are 
abstract terms, pro-Israel, anti-Israel, right. anti-Semitic, that term, which refers to real historic persecution of Jews and the mentality behind it, uh, has been hollowed, of, just completely hollowed out and is basically devoid of all meaning thanks to its flagrant abuse by the Israel lobby against its deployment against anyone who speaks up for the basic humanity of Palestinians. But the issue is Zionism. Zionism is Jewish nationalism. It's the belief that uh, there, that Israel has a right to maintain a Jewish demographic majority through violent social engineer and political engineering. And that means committing politicide against the Palestinian people, um, containing them in cantons behind walls in the Gaza Strip, which is an open air prison, and then maintaining this hostile presence in a region which is a diverse but majority Muslim where Israel has attacked all of its neighbors, constantly attacking them in order to maintain this position and satisfy its main patron in the United States. Uh, Alexander Haig, the former uh, Secretary of State to Reagan called Israel our aircraft carrier in the Middle East. And that's the role that it's been playing towards Iran, but it also goes beyond US interests in weakening Iran's revolutionary government and circling and containing it and actually uh, you know, carrying out its own very provocative attacks inside Iranian territory. We've seen it use the Mossad to kill an Iranian scientist, Mohsen Fakhrizadeh, uh, several months ago. Is, uh, it re just attacked the Natanz nuclear facility, which uh, was not producing weapons grade uranium. And this was an attack designed not only to provoke Iran, but to sabotage the upcoming JCPOA negotiations in Vienna. And it came as defense, U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin landed in Tel Aviv and was going to meet his counterpart, Benny Gantz. So three hours after Israel attacks the Natanz facility, in Iran. I mean, this is just a straight up state terror attack, or you just call it a military attack on a sovereign country, an act of war. Lloyd Austin tweets out, great to meet my uh, counterpart here, Defense uh, Minister Gantz, great guy, says nothing about it and basically endorses what Israel just did. Um, so this is why I think the US and the Biden administration isn't really serious about returning to this deal because it would require them eliminating all of the sanctions that the Trump administration proposed, all of the new sanctions designed to starve Iran's civilian population out and eliminating all of the, or actually returning to allowing Iran to actually enrich Uranium. Right. That's the natural outcome, right? If there's no treaty, then they have no reason not to. Uh, and if we condone uh, tacitly or otherwise attack military attacks on them from Israel, that's motivation to uh, develop, restart their nuclear program as a deterrent. So it seems to me, and, and where I was going with both this and the Ukraine, is that it seems to me that there are not only grave ethical problems with what we're doing, but just tactically uh, uh, that we're not thinking even one step ahead as a government, much less three or four steps ahead, because what happens next? A war between Israel and Iran? Well, then what? Iran is not Afghanistan. It's not Iraq. Right. It's much right. larger. It's much wealthier. Uh, what, then we're supposed to come in on the side of Israel? Even then, you know, we couldn't, you know, quote unquote, win in Iraq or Afghanistan. What's going to happen? Because uh, it seems to me this is the rocky, the slippery slope to war right now that we're talking about. And, uh, and there's no, just even if you put ethics aside, which I would never choose to do, but just e even if you're amoral, it just makes no sense to me. Yeah, I, I think there are two points that need to be to be made. And the first is that well, I talked about the attack on Natanz 
the killing of an Iranian scientist. Uh, set, there have been several assassinations of Iranian scientists by the Mossad inside Iranian borders, but there have been constant attacks on Iranian shipping and often on shipping that's seeking to bring oil to Syria. And the U.S. is using Israel as kind of its mad dog to enforce this starvation sanction re regime on Syria. There have been literally hundreds of Israeli missile attacks on Syria around the capital, Damascus. There have been there was a mine attack, a limpet mine attack on an Iranian ship in the Red Sea last week. And this was uh, unusual or an escalation because normally the mines are above the surface, but this mine was apparently placed so that it would completely sink the ship, failed to do so. But Israel is escalating. And it, it's, it's always referred to as like this, 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 this shadow war, but Israel's clearly pushing the line and see and trying to push as it has with Palestinians in the West Bank in the past, where it's tried to provoke an intifada in order to say the Palestinians don't want peace by using live fire. It's doing this kind of on a geopolitical scale with Iran and Iran is in a position. I mean, this is important too. It's, it, it, it's, it's kind of like understanding Russia's national interests and its geopolitical position. Uh, it's in a position where it's also surrounded it is an independent country where the U.S. has sought regime change for decades, along with Israel. Israel sort of the front line uh, means of destabilizing Iran. But Iran has also been encircled since the proxy war in Syria by ISIS, the Islamic State, by all of these Sunni extremist forces influenced by Wahhabism who believe that Shia Muslims must be exterminated. And that... Um, was the pr primary triumph of the former, the late IRGC commander, Qasem Soleimani, who was assassinated by the Trump administration, was the defeat of ISIS. This saved Iran's strategic depth. It was, a, it, it was basically about saving Iran from being infiltrated and destabilized by a force of fascistic fanatics who actually seek the extermination of its own population who were being armed by the West and its allies in the Gulf. So Iran has also ballistic missiles that it's been developing uh, very successfully. And this is also part of Iran's strategic deterrence. These are not nuclear tipped ballistic missiles, but this is what we saw Iran use to retaliate against the assassination of the second most powerful or important political figure, Soleimani, by the US, it attacked the Al-Assad military base inside Iraq where the US has all these bases, they have special forces bases and then they have this giant Al-Assad complex. Uh, the ballistic missile attack was successful in that it didn't kill any US troops but it sent a message to the US. And what the US is demanding from Iran is that it give up its ability to defend itself from these forces which seek to overthrow its government and terrorize its population. The Biden administration is demanding it give up its ballistic missile technology, which is a new demand, and it's demanding that it stop uh, its, what it would call terrorist activity or its um, hostile aggressive activity in the region. And those are the Shia militias that defeated ISIS. That is Hezbollah, which helped prevent Lebanon from falling to Al Qaeda and ISIS, and which many Lebanese people see as a defense, the only line of defense against Israel, which has attacked Lebanon constantly, invaded it, occupied it, uh, had troops in Beirut throughout the 80s. So it, for Iran to give that up, it basically means Iran gives up its entire revolutionary project. It just gives up, makes itself vulnerable to regime change. And we saw what happened to Libya, where Gaddafi tried to normalize with the West, gave up uh, his weapons of mass destruction, which were part of Libya's strategic deterrence, uh, you know, f paid all this money to the victims of the Lockerbie Scotland Pan Am bombing. And then as these fanatical proxy forces from the Isl Libyan Islamic fighting group and other militias were bearing down on him and NATO was bombing him. He tried calling Tony Blair, former British PM who had helped him negotiate and normalize with the West. And Tony Blair hung up the phone and said, you're screwed, buddy. 
So yeah. that is what be- Iran would get if it agreed to these conditions. And those are the conditions that the Biden administration is demanding. They're extremist conditions that show no respect for the country on the other side of the negotiating table. And it seems to me there are two other dimensions to this, too, at least two. But uh, one is, at the same time, uh, during the Trump years, and I think continuing now, you find uh, Iran, in effect, being encircled as the Sunni Arab oligarchies, one by one, make their deals with Israel under United States supervision, creating a kind of putative alliance encircling Iran that's going to cause it to hunker down even more into a war posture because these are governments that are implacably, I would think, hostile to Iran. Uh, You have Netanyahu embattled, encircled, despotic, corrupt, uh, with no motivation to dial back. But it seems to me here, as in Ukraine, and, oh, the other dimension I wanted to mention was And then, of course, we're still applying sanctions in Iran, right, as we are in Russia, sanctions being an enormously brutal act of war that have been presented domestically in the United States as somehow peaceful and gentle, but it's even without COVID, which makes it all that much worse, kills children, kills old people, kills sick people, kills innocent people. So this war on the civilian population um, where does anybody in the Biden administration uh, forget ethics? Where do they think this is all going? Well, I don't think they have a vision. And I think even if they did, they are so such prisoners to powerful domestic forces like the Israel lobby or the Pentagon or just the ideology that I de- described that you know, Blinken and other figures uphold, uh, that they're unable to advance a clear vision that really succeeds in producing a peaceful outcome that advances actual U.S. interests in the region. So, yeah, they're they're certainly not an honest broker. But here is, I think, here are the, like, two possible outcomes I could see um, if the JCPOA is scrapped. And one is that, you know, the gloves come off and this new regional, this formal regional alliance, which really um, consolidated the longstanding bond between Israel and the extremist Gulf monarchies, the Sunni monarchies, is that they'll just, they'll, they'll start pushing Iran much harder. They'll be increasing attacks on Iranian shipping and they'll try to provoke Iran because Iran's response to having its nuclear facility, the Natanz facility attacked is to enrich uranium to 60%, um, which Israel views as this existential threat. And, and Netanyahu, he genuinely sees this all in terms of the Holocaust. He really sees it that way uh, and is dangerous in that regard. So you could see a regional war erupt uh, with the U.S. kind of losing any leverage it would have had over Iran and Israel, then you have the other scenario. I mean, it both could overlap, which is that Iran has been able to uh, survive despite one of the most brutal sanctions regimes ever imposed. I mean, as harsh as what the U.S. did to Iran, to Iraq in the 1990s. But Iraq, Iran has ports, it has lots of sea access, and it's able to uh, maintain a domestic industrial base. Its population is very innovative. It has been under sanctions since the 1980s and has developed what uh, its leadership calls the resistance economy. Uh, it's been able to actually provide for its population, you know, free medical care, free uh, education, at, at, at a pretty uh, efficient rate. So this is a major threat to the U.S. And then, then there is the growing alliance of Russia and China who have been brought together right. by the U.S. sanctions regime and this just the, this, this hostility. The more the U.S. pushes one, the more it becomes closer to the other. And Iran is playing a role in this emerging, I would call, counter-hegemonic Alliance, And what brings these countries together is the desire for 
a new kind of finance, international financial system that right. eliminates the need for the U.S. SWIFT tra uh, financial transfer system, which the U.S. uses to enforce sanctions. Now, if the U.S. can no longer enforce sanctions because there is a new financial system that allows other countries to trade outside of the one that the U.S. dominates, and this is the whole, the Treasury Department has an entire wing called OFAC that enforces that. It. Its only role is to enforce the power and domination of the U.S. financial system and the dominance of the dollar over other countries to ensure that sanctions work, that they quote unquote have teeth. Once these countries break out of it and they're working to break out of it, they're also right. developing other mechanisms like crypto. That will be one of the biggest developments of the 21st century. And it will really mean an end to U.S. global tyranny. And that's the direction that Iran is moving in historically, whether or not the JCPOA is signed. And because there's a new election coming up in Iran, there's increasing pressure on Hassan Rouhani, the president, to just move more, accelerate that process, because that's what the so-called hardliners, who are really just Iranian nationalists, believe in. And to me, Max Blumenthal, it's, uh, you know, and maybe it's something just crystallized for me while, while we were talking, because as you know, I, I think one of the most underreported stories of the year was the, so uh, last few months anyway, was uh, China's treaty, with Pacific Treaty, with a number of countries notably excluding the U.S., which has a Pacific coast, um, which to me forms the foundation of this alternate uh, economic system that you're talking about. And a part of me never really closed the circle of why I've heard that discussed and described as a threat to U.S. security, because like, you know, let them deal with each other. Or what do I care if, you know, it's not a military threat, but of course, because we use sanctions as a military weapon, because we use financial transactions and our ability to monitor them as a, as a system of global espionage, in a sense, it is a national security threat, but it's also a way to get large portions of the world out from under the thumb of not only our, our military or quasi-military control, but our usurious financial demands on developing countries. I mean, fair, agree, disagree? That's a great point. China signed a 25-year trade deal with Iran. These are very different trade deals than the kind that the U.S. signs with Mexico uh, you know, a NAFTA or the, um, you know, Trans-Pacific Partnership or the free trade area of the Americas where one side is sort of being exploited and dominated. Um, these are trade deals that are considered win-win and Iran will gain in infrastructure. China will get access to the Iranian market, Iranian agriculture. And what the U.S. loses here is leverage over Iran. I mean, they've lost, they've rapidly they're rapidly delinking themselves from China and the U.S. will suffer economically from that. But they're, they're losing leverage over Iran because they can't starve it out and say, until you agree to remove your government, which is scary to our friends in Israel, you know, we're going to continue to starve you. Well, China has some China has something else to say about that. And we're seeing increasing independence, not only in the Middle East, but also in Europe. The whole Eurasian landmass is moving away from the US, which is sort of the nightmare scenario spelled out in Zbigniew Brzezinski's Grand Chessboard book, which lays out the kind of US imperial strategy going forward from the 1980s, which is to dominate the largest landmass on the world by keeping its most powerful countries divided from one another, specifically Russia and China. And Brzezinski actually explicitly spells out a scenario where Russia and China, there's no longer this Sino-Soviet split. They come together with Iran and the US loses access to all of the resources there, uh, you know, which is what all of this, all of the, the hysteria about the Nord Stream pipeline Two is about right now, where the U.S. is actually threatening to sanction Germany and German businesses 
the key the, the, the keystone of the transatlantic alliance is now being threatened by the U.S. because it wants to import cheap, liquefied natural gas from Russia. There's really no alternative from Germany. And there's nothing to, that, that will stop this pipeline short of some kind of war in Ukraine. And by the way, Ukraine is going to suffer from this because uh, its own gas companies will no longer have a market um, so this is part that partly explains the tension, but the U S is doing everything it can, including threatening its own allies to stop this new world order, which is a multipolar world order coming into view. And if you add on to that, Max, uh, the loans that China is being to make available to the developing world at terms that are much, uh, more, uh, reasonable than those of the IMF and related organizations and much less neoliberal, you, we really could see the unwinding of this U.S.-led global financial uh, empire, don't you think? Well, the Senate, the U.S. Senate has just authorized in bipartisan fashion a bill that lays out the poly or, or it's, it, it funds and it provides funding for this new strategy to contain China. It's basically, you know, war with China bill. It kind of reminds me of the Iraq Liberation Act that was passed by the Senate in the 90s, except that there's no way the U.S. can win this war. And one thing that it focuses on in this bill is countering the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, which is, you know, the new Silk Road with these win-win right. trade deals that enable the construction of infrastructure and give China access to all of these markets uh, from Africa to Latin America, all the way across Europe. And the bill doesn't provide any counterweight to the Belt and Road Initiative or any alternative for these countries, countries in Africa that are seeking to develop, for example. It just provides money for the media to, dom to demonize the Belt and Road Initiative. It, I mean, it's, it's an unbelievable bill. There's something like $300 million dollars to sponsor what it calls independent media on the dangers of the Belt and Road Initiative. So they're basically- well, that probably means bloggers. Um, the, you know, and I'm so shocked to hear you say that, Max, because normally when Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer agree on something, it's really good. So uh, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, we're gonna have to leave it there. But as always, Max Blumenthal, thanks for helping us put this all in some context. And as always, thanks for coming on the program. Thanks a lot, RJ. And we'll be right back after this. I am Richard R.J. Eskow, and this is The Zero Hour.